Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Ajit Apuhamni from Sri Lanka. Dr. Apuhamni completed his undergraduate from Sri Lanka and then moved on to the UK, where he completed his higher surgical training, including the FRCS trauma and orthopedics, as well as the EBOT exam. If you've noticed, Dr. Apuhamni has lectured on our channel several times, and today he's going to discuss about cerebral palsy for the FRC trauma and orthopedics. So today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Ajit Apuhami for this fantastic live program. Over to you, Ajit. Thank you very much, Hitesh. Good evening, everybody. So <clears throat> uh, today I'm going to discuss about cerebral palsy. Actually, it's not a very hot topic for the FRC exam, but you need to know that. If you're going for the FRC exam, you need to do it because it's, it's often, very often, frequently questioned in the MCQ paper. Sometimes it could be a you know, short case or intermediate case, probably not a long case. So if you know the facts, and sometimes it's a common location in the viva table, especially in the pediatric viva table, they will go show some pictures and ask so many things under this topic. It is uh, the range of uh, facts is very uh, not demarcated, but it's a vast topic. It's it's a actually it's a very big topic. But under FRCS, I will I will uh, going to uh, give a very summary of the picture of the under cerebral palsy. What you need to know before the FRCS exam under this lecture. So if we move in with the definition wise, so we'll start with it's a. It's a permanent and non-progressive motor disorder owing to the brain damage from birth or during the first two years. This, that's very important at the time frame because it's a before birth and after birth, after two years, if something happened to the brain, so we can, it's, it's possible to develop cerebral palsy. It's basically, it's developed a upper motor nerve palsy. It's commonly involved. Literally, it's uh, literally this lesion is uh, static, yet its clinical picture is quite progressive. That's why it's a disease, it's a kind of a spectrum of the disease. If you discuss at the point, it's, it's, it has a vast range because of its clinical progressive picture. When you talk about the incidence, it's about two in 2,000 uh, incident rate is there. So there's a few pictures. So when you talk about the etiology, there are two thirds, uh, sorry, uh, one third of cases, there is no, uh, there is no exact cause. But rest of the causes, because of the time frame, what I discussed, they have categorized the causes prenatal, perinatal and the postnatal. This prenatal causes, these are the, uh, this is uh, this etiological uh, component would be a free collocation in your MCQ paper. Make sure, that, because I have highlighted few areas you need to know, because they frequently ask in your MCQ paper. When you come to the prenatal, that means before birth, it's commonly the, the uh, placental insufficiency, bleeding, and smoking habits, alcohol habits, and the infections, mainly the torch, that means toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex type 2. When you go to perinatal, the prematurity is the most common type, except uh, in addition to that, anoxic injuries, again, infection, chronic terrors, and multiple birth traumas, and placental abruption. When you come to the postnatal, that means two years after delivery, it's mainly infection, then probably it's a head injury also, head trauma can cause cerebral palsy. This type of classification, this is a very important area and they frequently question in the viva table. There are three main classifications we need to discuss about. Friendly is a physiology, then anatomy, then gross motor function classification uh, system and the, the later one is a Hoffer classification. That you, didn't, you don't have to know about main detail about the Hoffer classification, but this I have highlighted clearly the gross motor function classification system is a very, very important thing. The frequently question in your MCQ paper and frequently asked in your viva table. So you need to know in detail all types of uh, types or types under gross motor function classification system. And you need to know how to identify that each type because that's very important. If it's a short case or intermediate case, they might ask 
okay tell me what, under which category you put this patient so you need to know these are the things i'm looking so i will explain one by one when you go into that classification system so if i wave into the physiological classification first so it's main three four types so that one first is the spastic spastic is mainly is damage to the pyramidal system is the pyramidal that's the commonest type of uh, physiological presentations of cerebral palsy is the spastic so it's quite common it's nearly 80% comes the spastic patient due to damage of pyramidal then dyskinesis that mean acetoid that's due to extra pyramidal lesions basal ganglia that it also has a wide range of uh, presentation balismus goria rigid and dystonia then uh, ataxic ataxis again it's extra pyramidal it's involved in the cerebellum and the brain stem region they lose the balance when you come to the grossly uh, pyramidal and extra pyramidal both the normal they will present as the mixed picture of the uh, this combinations of spastic and acetosis this is a physiological classification that spastic dyskinetic and ataxic then anatomical classification this anatomical classification we divide amount uh, the area involvement whether is a one limb involvement we call that monophagic if the one side involvement hemiplegic diplegic and tetraplegic or three involvement is uh, triplegic so this diplegic quadriplegic and the mono, uh, hemiplegic is quite common so now we are coming to the most vital area that the gross motor function classification system why this function system uh, this classification system is quite important it it has a very predictive for the hip subluxation because hip subluxation is a very important orthopedic complication uh, we can see in the cerebral ball, uh, cerebral palsy patient so because this gross motor uh, gross motor function classification system has a very uh, good very close correlation with this hip subluxation so we can classify type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 type 5 so i will tell exactly how do you identify in your this classification system i'll tell how i remembered how try to i try to memorize this classification system when i was studying so i'll start from the backwards to on uh, uh, from back to forwards so i'll start with the type 5 in the type 5 patient type 4 and type 5 patient usually they are wheelchair bound usually they are wheelchair bound the very important thing if you see a patient if patient is wheelchair bound they can they can do a very independent mobility then you have to look for the head stability they can keep the head straight so it always classified as type level type 5 then people who are wheelchair bound they can keep their head straight by their own so they we can classify this type 4 so that's how we differentiate type 5 and type 4 then we go into the <clears throat> uh type 3 type 3 is they can't walk without uh, assistant devices either walking frame or wheelchair or so stick support or whatever they always need a assistant device to mobilize inside and outside so we classified but rest of the all they are really good and their head control good their mobility is everything but still they need a assistance with the devices so that is type 3 then type 1 and type 2 when you go to type 1 is they are perfectly inside and outside they are completely independent but they are become little bit compromised when they perform the gross motor functions very advanced functions they they become very compromised but <clears throat> type 2 it is uh, again independent mobility but when they go to outside the house community based their mobility they are a little bit compromised that's the way i remember this classification system so i hope that uh, it's up to you to decide so people have different different uh, methods of memorizing so that's how i start from backwards because head uh, head support is quite very important when you are assessing the cerebral palsy patient so that's why i always start from type 5 then type 4 then i'll go backwards to uh, type 1 uh, that's how i memorized you can apply whatever the suitable for you 
So when you go to the Hoffa classification, that is based again in the, according to the ambulatory status. The grade one people who can do the community ambulation, the grade two is a household ambulation. Get three again is a, with the support of the assistant devices is a th therapeutic ambulation, and people are non ambulatory we classified as type four. Okay. When you talk about the spectrum of the disease, the natural history of the disease is always, as I said at the beginning, it's a kind of a upper motor lesion. It's always very common is a spastic lesion. So they presented with the spastic disease. So if it's a prolonged spastic, what happens is the prolonged contractions of the muscle. Muscles become very short and then they develop into contractures. These contractures, again, you start with the dynamic contraction, then it's going to fix contraction with the Contraction then it leads to deformities and subluxation. And later on, when the patients are non-ambulatory, then what happens? The bone quality, the mineral density goes off, and there's a possibility of trivial fractures. So at the later, when you talk about the prognosis, I right, the spectrum of the disease, it's more reliable to predict of the ability of walking. <clears throat> Walk is independent, is uh, independent sitting by age two years. There are more possibility, it's a very reliable predictor for ability to walk. So that's why we always, when you get the small children as a, a short case or intermediate case, where or we always ask from the mother at which age child start to sit independently, at which age child start to stand with the support. So those are very predictive uh, elements we can assess about his future independence. So when you talk about the evaluations of the cerebral pulse, as I said, it's a spectrum of disease. It's a plethora of problems. It's not a single problem. So it basically we have to approach this a multidisciplinary approach. Not only orthopedic surgeons, a lot of pediatricians, neurologists, sometimes they are associated with a lot of epilepsy, motor sensory cognitive problems, speech problems, hearing defects, visual impairments, feeding defects, learning and behavior problems, rather than anything else. We need to address about the psychological support, especially for the caregivers, especially for the parents, because they are they're basically mentally compromised looking after this kind of, uh, you know, functionally this uh, compromised child. So you imagine, so we, they need a very, it's, uh, what I feel, it's very vital to give them adequate psychological support to keep them, uh, to prepare their mind to be the constant or persistent support to that child to be, uh, become independent. So when you talk, about, uh, when you wave in into orthopedic evaluation, so I will talk about the persistence of uh, primitive reflexes. That's a very <coughs> common area of the question in the MCQ paper because usually we all know that reflexes is a primitive reflexes. All normal, healthy infants they come up with reflexes. There are primitive reflexes, but they disappear when they develop, when they grow up, then they start myelination of the neurons. They gradually dissolve, they uh, gradually disappear their primitive reflexes at the different stages, four months, six months, like that. Usually these primitive re reflexes me usually mediated by extrapyramidal system. What happens when the brain start myelination further and further, then development of the pyramidal system, they gradually primitive system, primitive reflexes disappear. But in a cerebral palsy children, they, are, they, they affect this uh, criminal system is grossly affected. They, they tend to uh, persist their primitive reflexes. That is uh, usually that shows if the people are having the primitive reflexes, persistent primitive reflexes, they are usually non ambulatory That's the one thing we need to remember in the MCP paper and the small child even in the short case, is you have to look for the primitive reflexes. And the other skeletal issues we need to see in, under orthopedic evaluation, spasticity and their voluntary movements, their weakness, how their coordination and the sensory impairment. When, it, uh, <clears throat> when, you, when I talk about spasticity, as I said you before, it's spasticity we can classify it against the spectrum. We start with the dynamic contractors because Spas the prolonged spasticity, the muscle become contracted and get shortened, then muscle develop fibrosis, then they they hesitate to contract further. So what happens? They increase the tone and they become very deformed features. But when you come to the dynamic stage, it's uh, that we can deformity, we can easily overcome during examination. But when you turn into which it is persistent that dynamic con contraction, then it's getting to the fixed contraction. 
that means again is a persistent passive and contractive we cannot overcome with examination they will, they develop a fixed deformity then what happen is a persistent fixed deformity is that leads to joint deformation joint subluxation and dislocation and the secondary bone changes this is a diagram i wanted to explain you because it's a it's a diagram i i made my hand so this is r1 r2 what r1 is a range range of motions we can classify range r1 and r2 so r1 mean is the amount of movement actively we can make now imagine patient is lying down we try to abduct so when you abduct in we feel the first catch that is r1 so we do further beyond that catch we feel some catchy phase so we have to stop here this bit resistant so we are doing further that is r2 range so this is the range between r1 and r2 is much more bigger it's more difference that means this muscle is in the spasticity stage between the r1 and r2 difference is very minimal it's, it's almost same that means muscles are the contracted this is say because that is a very important thing that's the area they can question in a viva table how do you know this muscle is in the spasticity or it's in the contract if you can draw with this simple diagram and talk about this r1 and r2 difference i think you can impress the examiner very easily then common sites in all in the cerebral palsy is mainly we talk about the spinal deformities and uh, hip joint as you said is a subluxation and dislocation then the flexion deformity of the knee foot and ankle deformities and the upper limb deformities the spine is a more common uh, common deformity developed in the cerebral palsy is scoliosis overall incidence nearly 20% and it's very uh, high risk category is spastic and quadriplegic patients because usually spastic and quadriplegic patient sides definitely in, uh, not independent so they are basically bedridden so there's a high possibility of getting scoliosis the it that incidence rate is approach up to 100% and this spine uh, deformities may be associated with pelvic tilt or may not associated with pelvic tilt so there is a classification system i don't think you need to know by name this classification winston classification they call the winston classification divided in type 1 and type 2 type 1 is people who can ambulators they have the very double curves very small curves in the thoracic and lumbar region but there's no involvement to the pelvic tilt but in the type 2 those are non ambulators they have large curvature in the lumbar and thoracic lumbar region but they have a marked pelvic obliquity i don't think you need to know in detail that kind of a uh, uh, detail about scoliosis and cerebral palsy but i want to if you know this this uh, uh, gross fact about cerebral palsy plus if you can identify that's another possible area they can ask how do you differentiate this they will show the extra of the cerebral palsy scoliosis and just say you for this scoliosis and what do you how can differentiate this scoliosis it is associated with cerebral palsy and it is idiopathic scoliosis that's a possible question to be asked so you need to i think you need to refer by your own and study some facts about that how to differentiate that to scoliosis cerebral scoliosis from idiopathic scoliosis okay then um, hip subluxation or dislocation that's a very vital area you need to know so if you talk about hip subluxation you need to know about the remus index that's frequently question in the mcq paper because uh, if you can't abduct less than if you can abduct less than 55 degrees and uh, looking at the anthroposity view of the pelvic x ray the head is uh, more than 30% uncovered and the remus index remus index when when we draw this x ray this horizontal line we call hillgrins lines and the outer margins of the assertive uh, is the perkins line so if you draw this line the gross that complete diameter of the head and the amount of uh, distance it's out of the perkins line the percentage between this a and b into 100 that is the remus uh, index so it is very uh, 
why uh, very important and it, because it has a more associated with this remus index shows very accuracy of the future subluxation so remus index is less than 33% that hip is quite risk at risk for the subluxation but the remus index is more than 33 so it is uh, basically we consider it as a subluxed hip and when it is dislocated here i'll show you dislocated hip is completely out so remus index is more than 100% it's completely out so then uh, what is other possibility is uh, other uh, spectrum is a uh, winsep hips winsep hips is uh, the one side is adducted and other side is abducted that happens is adducted side is adductor contraction they adduct the uh, that side and the contralateral side is abductors are contracted and that keeps in the abducted position that is called winsep deformity okay what are the, uh, then we go into the knees so knees is a commonly is a fixed flexion deformity of the knees due to hamstring spasticity so very important thing you need to remember when you are correcting procedure of the hamstring release lengthening the hamstring to reduce this flexion flexion deformity of the hip you always remember need to remember cause spasticity of the cartilage because if you keep the knee flex position for a long period due to spasticity of the hamstring and equally the front muscles the quadriceps also keep on stretching and this is the passive for the long period they develop cause passivity now even though we reduce we correct the deformity of the knee by releasing hamstring but the persistence of this cause passivity of the quadriceps they will not accomplish their uh, desired function so it's always remember when you are releasing in the hamstring then you always you to release to a certain extent quadriceps release passive that's very vital thing and another thing is that could be question in your viva table if you give the fixed section knees and how do you correct then if you mention this cause passivity of the quadriceps then examiner will understand this is some sensible person he has some broad idea about this uh disease then popliteal angle so that is the popliteal angle we measure we flex the hip and then we'll measure the angle between the vertical and this uh, maximum uh, extended position so that is called popliteal angle so we measure the popliteal angle in the knees and then other thing is uh, due to flexion deformities of the hips and knees they get the spastic crouch contact contractures so this is basically due to flexion uh, flexions of hips and flexions of knees and ankle dorsiflexion so this uh, you, you can see here that the the person is a bit of a partially uh, you know that is called crouching position so when they walk in also they with this uh, same uh, type of walk so there are different type of walking patterns we identify in the cerebral palsy this is the pattern i discussed with the crouch gait then could be the equinus something jumping gait then true equinus so <clears throat> but i want to emphasize i really doubt whether you need to know in that detail in your frcs exam because i understand the normal visual uh, normal what you call that or the uh, general uh, basic science viva table you need to know about all components about gait mechanism but i really really doubt whether they will ask in detail about the this abnormal gaiting system they will ask some mcq points and the crouching gait what is the position and those things but um, i really doubt whether you need to know that detail but i will touch this this uh, very superficial touch uh, to the sake of completion of my talk okay then what are the uh, uh, possible uh, deformities we can see in the foot and ankle so as i said is equinus and equinovarus and equinovalgus this again is related to the spasticity equinus probably is the triceps sura uh, contraction it can wear as due to tibialis posterior spasticity and it can valgus is the spasticity of peroneal muscle so when you go into the upper limb usually uh, it's very important sometimes they give the uh, short case or sometimes the intermediate case they will give the patient with the cerebral palsy they will ask okay tell me what are the clinical findings so if you can explain what you can see the shoulder internally rotated is a cerebral palsy this is a typical picture we can see the shoulder is internally rotated and forearm is pronated with elbow flexion wrist flexion and thumb is in the palm deformities and fingers are in the flex deformities if you can uh, 
explain is quite this is a typical picture of the cerebral palsy child is keeping the hand is extended in turn rotator position with the flex position with this scissoring gait so if you can explain this this is finders you can see so you need to master it before the exam because you will not go you will not get those things spontaneously at the at the time of exam so you need to practice these systems so then you can easily score very well in your short cases so a general examination part because as a orthopedic uh, exam so you need to know what are the important thing in the aspect uh, in the uh, view of orthopedic point of view so so in the general examination you need to know when you get a patient you need to know okay tell okay patient is there is a wheelchair there are walking aids there are some uh, communication devices sometimes they are using hearing aids so mention everything you can see in this uh, in that patient and there are some orthoses sometimes the people uh, i can i i have my personal experience because i got one patient but he, i really doubt whether it's a cerebral palsy it's not a cerebral but he, there was a orthosis that patient has been using but it was removed and it was kept somewhere adjacent to the uh, patient's bed so luckily i noticed that if you don't mention that's very important you have to keep your eyes widely open when you are examining the patient so keep a look surrounding and mention what you can see everything because sometimes it's a very important fact if you meet then patient uh, the examiner will get a little bit uh, annoyed mm. that you you missed a very important uh, uh, thing so those are very uh, tiny tiny tricky things you need to be very alert because in the exam setup it's a kind of a competitive and it's very important so you need to look at the uh, make sure that you will expose the patient because sometimes in the trunk for the gastrostomy subcutaneous reservoirs for a, a baclofen pump because muscle relaxant there is a baclofen pump you can see if you keep the clothes patients is wearing uh, clothes so we might miss it and look for the head control it's very very important because if patient has no head control i don't we know that patient is definitely better than patient and will chap on patient so and next thing is <clears throat> look for the uh, pattern of involvement whether it is a uh, uh, monoplegic diplegic or diplegic so looking at this you can uh, mention about this and very important thing if you get a patient child for the exam always talk to the mother always talk to the mother and say, ask whether the child can walk sometimes we, we, they will keep the cerebral palsy child on the bed and keep and the mother, mother is next to him then if you ask him to walk if you don't ask from mother we don't know whether the child can walk or not so we do more harm if you try, if we ask patient to walk child can't understand if try, child jumps on the bed then something happen it's a disaster so always talk to the man ask whether the child can stand up whether the child can get down from the bed and start talking to mother and get some little bit detail because it will be helpful for your rest of your examination finding because it's very important to judge whether the patient is ambulatory or non ambulatory because that that make a huge vast difference of your management plan and describe the body position as i said is the upper limb involvement how it is internal rotated elbow extension the flex of the wrist and fingers and thumb in the hand tell everything as a flow so it's very easy and it's very impressive and when you go into the so ambulatory then talk, uh, if patient is ambulatory then it's very important you have to assess you always ask the patient to walk and assess his gait pattern what is how is the normal gait pattern how is swing his hand he needs strength is a symmetrical gait and look at the feet look at the knees look at his hips and look at his rotational profiles everything look at his pelvis is the tilting or with its levels and look at his trunk and look at his, his low doses and scoliosis everything look <clears throat> this has a couple of gait patterns so this is the toe walking child so hip examination you can then ask the patient to gross examination and then ask the patient to walk then you can ask okay can you get into the bed and look because hip examination even though i understand it's not a easy it's it sometimes is a daunting task to do in the proper hip examination in the cerebral palsy patient rather than doing the normal patient so at least you need to offer to the examiner so i'm happy to do the hip examination then if the examiner doesn't like so if i say okay don't worry about the hip because show that hip examination is very vital because hip subluxation contractility and the spasticity we need to assess because that is very important to the mo uh, mobility of the patient so by asking that question by offering the hip examination 
the examiner will stick that mark you are concerned about the hip of the cerebral palsy child. That's that's very important. So even though you do not examine, so so you can examine the abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation. As I said, R1 and R2 you can assess separately. On the special test, you can do the Thomas test to do the hip flexion, defer fixation, deformity. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to talk here how to do that examination. You can go go to the internet and go to the YouTube and say Thomas test, accurate technique. Because people have different different techniques. But what I tell you that stick for one technique, because sometimes if you work under two three consultants, they have different uh, methods. So whatever method, stick for one method in your exam because. You can't do couple of methods in front of exam. So if you are doing the Thomas test, stick for one thing, and then uh, abductor contractures, Ober's test, Duncan Ellis test. So this all for the assumption of contraction. Then knee joint examination again, as I said, is we can do the patella position inspection and this range of movement, and we can assess the popliteal angle. Then foot 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 and ankle examination very important. Then you need to need the Deformity. You need to assess the tight Achilles, tight Achilles tendon. Very important thing. Don't, do not forget. Do not forget to do the silver skull test. It is very, very important because because I know that in the foot examiners, all these examiners are keeping their eyes widely open, like eagles, to see whether uh, whether uh, candidate will forget the silver skull test because it's a very vital test because that will change the whole management plan. So don't forget, I'm not going to tell what is silver skull test here. That is to the uh, quadricep muscle tightening because we are check the soleus in the full extended position. Then we flex again and do the dorsiflexion again. If it is the same range or if it is further, so we can assess if the contraction is only the soleus or it's involving the gastrocnemius. So it, that decision is very very important. So we need to do the silver skull test. Then when you go into the management. Plan. When you talk about the management plan, it's always it's always multidisciplinary approach. Our target, our goal of uh, management is accomplish or achieve ambulation. If there's a patient is non-ambulatory, or if there's a patient is ambulatory, get the functional achievement. If the patient is non-ambulatory, so we have to go get at least basic hygiene procedures. That is, try to make your patient ambulatory or try to make patient independent. If patient is ambulatory and cut uh, to a certain extent is independent, then we need to do our management to focus to improve his functional ability. So it's it's even the goal is also varies from person to person according to his clinical fit and his uh, um, functional status. So if it is a dynamic contracture, so we had to go for a physiotherapy, stretching exercise, casting, orthosis, and we can use some dorsal sinotomy and we can intramuscular botulinum injection for the muscle relaxation and intrathecal back to front. And it's a flex flexion deformity. Now imagine there is no, uh, it's a fixed, right? we can't, it's fast, it is gone, so we can't explain, we can't do the function. Then it is fixed. Then it's a principle is a single evil multiple level surgery. That is the key thing you need to remember. Because birthday surgeries are now out of span. It's, we need to avoid birthday surgeries. We have to go for a single even multiple level surgeries. What we can we can do the tendon release, tendon lengthening, muscle transfer, slipping tendon transfer, and bony procedures. When you go to scoliosis, now we'll take one by one scoliosis. You need to know it's a custom molded seat we can insert to allow the better positioning, but it will not that evidence says it doesn't give any prevention for the curve progression. In the bracing, bracing also is a little bit controversial because bracing would be helpful to improve the sitting balance, but it doesn't affect for the corrections of the curvature. So bracing is also for the cerebral palsy is quite controversial. It's a type one, that means uh, 
small curvatures without pellicle we can go for a posterior fusion that is for the mobility type 2 we need a posterior and anterior both fusion with the <coughs> we can extend our fixation up to the pelvis because to correct the pelvic shape i don't think you need to know in that detail but i'm just touching this area as for sake of completion when you come to the hip subluxation according to the nice guideline we initially because usually the cerebral palsy that symptoms they come become more dominant after one or two years so we usually perform pelvic x-ray at the age of 3 years then after that we have to screen annually the target the three main categories of the management of this hip block hip subluxation initially we go for a preventive procedures this preventive procedure mean that to uh, slow down hip subluxation the preventive procedures we always go for the soft tissue procedures like tendon release uh, adductor release uh, swaz tendon release that's all for preventive procedures the target is to slow down no hip subluxation then second stage is a reconstructive procedure reconstructive procedure is it's a sublux hip then we have to go for bony procedures plus soft tissue procedures the bony procedures we have to go for b rotation various b rotation osteotomies in the proximal humerus plus or minus pelvic osteotomy target is to, to maintain the congruency of the hip joint i don't think you need to know that surgical procedure what you have to do so you have to tell this we had to go preventive measures as the soft tissue measures preventive measures initially target is to slow down of subluxation then we can go for a constructive measures that soft tissues and bony procedures target is to maintain the congruency at the last step is a salvage procedure if the hip is completely out this kind of a x ray this kind of a patient okay. yes this kind of a patient we can go for any uh, procedure so we have to go for a salvage procedure salvage procedures could be a uh, but a salvage procedures could be proximal femoral resections so i discussed this already hip batteries we do the soft tissue and injection then sublux we do osteotomies yes i discussed that then winsep again it's adduct adducted hip we have to release adductors if it is abductor we have to release abductors and then once you correct then we have can combine with bony procedures it's where this is again like spine you need to know about spastic hip from dysplastic hip how to differentiate because usually this dysplastic hip is abnormal from the beginning so we can we recognize within first year but spastic cerebral palsy hip usually initially it's normal once it's spastic and then develop contracted then it's a subsequential uh, it's a sequential development of this uh, subluxation <coughs> usually it recognized after 2 years so usually it's a radiological diagnosis spastic but dysplastic we can do the otolani and balos physical examine initially we can assess and we can do the ultrasound scan initial later we do the after one year x-rays and causative factors for the spastic mainly is the muscle spasticity but dysplastic if it is multifactorial dth so it is mechanical hormonal and social factors then in subluxation again in spasticity it's progressive subluxation but uh, there is no uh, uh, such a progressive in uh, dysplastic hip so it is dysplastic is dysplastic when the acetabular deficiency usually it's uh, deficient in the postural superior but usually in the dysplastic is usually anterior deficient so this kind of a uh, couple of differences because that can be questioned in your viva table and the mcq paper how do you differentiate given the x ray in the pediatric viva how do you differentiate whether this is dysplastic or is a spastic hip so if you know this is fast then you can nicely argue counter argue so as i said before when you are releasing contractures uh, we have to release hamstring release and we have to think about cause spasticity of the quadriceps we have to release that as well then foot correction we can go the ankle uh, equinus correction we have to do the uh, silver skull test to ex exclude tight gastrocnemia if it is uh, not involving gastrocnemia we can go for atelectasis and lengthening and 
equinovarus that is due to tibialis posterior spasticity we had to split the tibialis posterior and transfer it also to the peroneus brevis and equinovarus is a spasticity due to peroneus muscle then upper limb target is to non ambulatory patient our target is to get the hygiene procedures to get hygiene procedures done if the ambulatory patient we have to get the functional procedures to day to day activities so that is a, that's also again we can start with orthoses and um, injections for the muscle relaxation for the spas spastic muscles then later we go for a surgery so sometimes uh, there's a one study is they some study shows uh, upper limb surgery they give more cosmetic outcome rather than functional outcome that is again is debatable how extend that till the upper limb surgeries will improve their functional life compared to uh, cosmetic is cosmetic is more prominent in limb to rather than functional outcome so again it's uh, debatable but at your stage you need to know if it is non ambulatory you think about the hygiene procedure to patient can wash their mouth wash their uh, poor side everything with the patient can do by his own so that is the target is a non ambulatory patient if is ambulatory patient we can target is to improve his further functional ability thank you very much one thing i i think i need to explain about this uh, one thing i forgot i think i'll get back sorry about that this coach gate crossing gate this idiopathic cause this idiopathic that if you do uh, uh, yes i mentioned here spastic crouch contraction may be iatrogenically precipitated by lengthening of the achilles tendon now imagine patient is coming with the spasticity of the hamstrings and we do the surgery achilles tendon and get the dorsiflexion but it's a, they can't ex, fully extend knees because of the spasticity of the hamstrings so if you do the surgery and achilles tendon lengthening procedure that goes to the spastic crouch gate because of as the I mean, atrogenic cause so that is also one mcq point i i wanted to mention specifically but i forgot to mention it there so it's important that it's a one important it, it could be question in your white paper i think that's the main area you need to know under cerebral palsy if you know that text then it should be more than enough probably it, it definitely won't be a long case as far as my knowledge it could be a short or intermediate case but it's probably a lot of questions would be asked in the mcq paper and would be a a viable table as especially in the pediatric table so that's all it is thank you very much thank you ajit for yet another brilliant presentation from your side really focused for the frcs yes uh, just a few questions uh, yeah. before we conclude the session uh, do you think uh we need to use a gate lab and look at the gate before you really go in for a semls procedure that is single event multilateral surgery because in case like you mentioned if you do a release and the patient actually gets downgrade so that is something you do a i mean like you addressed about co spasticity issues yeah, yeah so do you yeah. think a gate lab is a must before we really do any kind of release definitely yes i would i think yes it's a must we have to do the thorough examination and thorough assessment even the gait also what i recommend go for a qualitative and quantitative assessment you know is a quantitative assessment we have to as a kinetic kind kinematics and uh, uh, all assessment we have to do and the qualitative only we assess the stages of the disease so then we can each muscle we can assess sometimes we can do the eng studies is for the qualitative uh, eng analysis for the quantitative assessment that is very important because then we can understand which which component is exactly important and to get the functional because we are going for a single you know it's called shark attack it should be multi level it's a shark attack so we can't address it it is a partially addressed that will not get the desired outcome so i agree with you you have to do the proper thorough assessment every aspect okay i think ajit uh, that's all the questions that we have for this session because you have covered inside out 
or cerebral palsy with respect to their fascias. Of course, there are a lot of things to go into detail. For example, okay, before we conclude, just one last question. Uh, what is the current relevance of doing a, an adductor release combined with an obturated neurectomy? Because that was a very common procedure in the past. Yeah. Pre it's a preventive procedure to avoid hip subluxation. Uh, actually, Hitesh, I'm not that aware of this obtu uh, obturator <clears throat> and this adductor release, so I need to follow because we had to look for the evidence. Okay, yeah, it was a very common procedure in the past that you, yeah. I mean, to avoid hip subluxation, you do an early adductor release along with an obturator neurectomy. And its uh, importance is gradually fading down of late. Yeah, okay. yeah, How because I'm not that familiar with that obturator neurectomy because I don't know, so... That's, yes. that's I need to read about it. Yeah, first. exactly. So that was a very popular procedure in the past, but uh, like you said, it's gradually wearing off and it's yeah, yeah. getting less popular nowadays. Okay, thank you, Ajit, for joining in. Fantastic no, presentation as usual. I mean, you've done a lot of lectures and they've all reached to a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining in. No problem. It's a pleasure.